Anyway, for this evening, uh, we do the chanting at uh, 7.50 and then 8 o'clock. We'll only do half an hour of um, questions and then we'll just go into the loving-kindness meditation and the final blessing. Because in the morning, you'll be very busy. And so, in the morning, I'm sure that many of you, most of you, will be up here at 6 o'clock in the morning doing the yoga. So <laughs> <laughs> Some might, but I doubt it. <laughs> you'll be in your beds dreaming. <laughs> Yo, so... <laughs> you suddenly wake up, oh, it's hard. Oh, what time is it? Where am I? <laughs> no, you can have a rest in the morning. It's a big day, it'll be a very busy day. And for those of you travelling, it's a very busy day travelling. So here we go. The, uh, the Nibbana through Anapanasati. So the only um, of the four Satipatthanas which I cover was the mindfulness of breathing. I'm oh, sorry, the mindfulness of the body. We also have to say with mindfulness of feelings, or I prefer calling it mindfulness of experience, then mindful of the mind, which is a very uh, interesting thing, which is very hard to actually to do that particular satipatthana, even though people think they're doing the mind, they're not. And then the mindfulness of mind objects. But you can have a look at that later for yourself if you wish. But here going through Nibbana, through Anapanasati, it brings everything together, especially through the meditation on the breath. So, Nibbāna Thuranapāna Sati, when mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, it is of great fruit and great benefit. When mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, it completes the four focuses of mindfulness. And when the four focuses of mindfulness are developed and cultivated, they complete the seven enlightenment factors. And when the seven enlightenment factors are developed and cultivated, they complete true knowledge and deliverance, enlightenment. And first of all, Anapana Sati, even the name Sati is like Satipatthana, mindfulness. Anna means along with. And uh, uh, Pana is a word for, for breath, which is also the word for a living being. As you remember, I hope, your first precept, Pāna Atipāta Viramani Sikāpadak Samadhyami. Atipāta means destroying. Destroying Pāna, living beings. And literally it means with breath. And uh, there is so much similarity with the Indian languages and with the, the Greek and Latin languages the word for breath in Latin is animalis. So something with breath is an animal. Animal. And animalis is the breath. Pana is an animal. And you know, the prana, or sometimes in Sanskrit, uh, pranayama, prana, that's the, the breath. So we do nibbana through uh, the mindfulness of the breath, but I pronounce it very clearly there, it's anapana sati. It is not anapana sati. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to do with torturing yourself. So, uh, mindfulness of breathing completes the four focuses of mindfulness, the four sati patana. And this is an important point because many times people say, Oh, watching the breath, anapanasati, is samatha meditation. And uh, satipatthana is vipassana meditation. And here you read that mindfulness of breathing completes the four focuses of mindfulness. So you, if four focuses of mindfulness, satipatthana, is vipassana, you complete vipassana by doing samatha. In other words, there's no difference between these two. Samatha, Vipassana, they're the same. Ajahn Chah, similarly, he would put his hand up. Because he didn't have much visual aids. Can you see the front of my hand, he would ask us. He'd say, yeah, but you can't see the back of my hand, can you? Now you can see the back of my hand, but you can't see the front. But I guarantee the front is still there, but you can't see it. 
just like samatha vipassana. You may only be able to see one side, you think you're just doing samatha, but vipassana is right behind. You think you're doing vipassana, but samatha is right behind, because you cannot split them up. He says samatha vipassana are like the back and the front of a hand. And you know, you may be one is slightly in front, but the other one is always behind. You cannot separate them. And I remember Ajahn Chah say that a lot. And so this is obviously one reason that the Buddha would agree with him. By doing Anapanasati, the classic samatha practice, you complete the four foundations of mindfulness, which is Vipassana. Anyway, mindfulness of breathing completes the four focuses of mindfulness. And how does mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated complete the four focuses of mindfulness? When the in-breath and out-breath are long, and you are aware that they are long, when the in-breath and out-breath are short, and you are aware that they are short, when you learn to experience the whole of the breath as you breathe in and out, when you learn to calm the breath as you breathe in and out, those are the first four stages of Anapanasati, which we also covered in the first of the Satipatthanas, mindfulness of the breath as part of the body. On those occasions, when you do the uh, first four stages of Anapanasati, you, uh, on those four occasions, you are mindful of the body, having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose and mindful. The in and out breathing is regarded by the buddhi as a body, in the category of bodies. That is why on that occasion, a meditator abides mindful of the body, having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose and mindful. So what we're saying here, rather what the Buddha is saying, is that uh, when you are doing the breath meditation, the first four stages, you know the breath is in, uh, is long or short, you know, kind of knowing the whole breath and then calming the breath, you're watching the breath, and the breath is part of this uh, thing we call the body, according to the Buddha. So that is an interesting point, because it's one of the strong arguments to say that the third of those uh, little practices, being able to experience the whole body of the breath, there it is very much the Buddha is talking about not the legs or the toes, you're talking about the body of the breathing. The breath is regarded as uh, a conglomerate which lies in that first of the Satipatthanas, the body awareness. It's body stuff. When you learn to... Exp now, the reason I go on to this because it's also important that when we meditate we're never afraid of happiness and joy. It's not as if that something goes wrong when we're enjoying ourselves in a religion. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, used to go to church, and the church was so cold. It was England, and there was no heating, it was all stone. And the, the pews were hard wood, and no one ever told a joke in church. <laughs> And as a kid, it was like a miserable place. And from that, you know, you sort of learn that, you know, you're going to a sort of a, a church or anything religious was just no fun at all. And that is even come even into some Buddhist practices as well, where you're not allowed to smile. You're not allowed to be happy. Like that uh, poor nun in the temple in Hong Kong. <laughs> or if you do start to get some joy in meditation, stop it, you'll get attached. <laughs> and this part here shows you're supposed to get some joy and happiness, and it's not getting attached, which is the problem here. It is fear. But anyway, when you learn to experience joy as you breathe in and out, when you learn to experience pleasure as you breathe in and out, when you learn to experience the mental formation, it's called the citta sankara of piti sukha together as you breathe in and out. When you learn to calm this mental formation of piti sukha as you breathe in and out, on that occasion you are mindful of experience, 
now having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose and mindful. For being mindful of the pleasure associated with this stage of the breath meditation is being mindful of experience, of Vedana. That is why on this occasion a meditator abides mindful of experience, having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose and mindful. Now there's a lot which comes out of just that little uh, paragraph, which is one of the reasons I wanted to mention it today, is that first of all, that you learn to experience the, the joy and the happiness which comes in meditation. You know, you relax to the max. And when you start to enjoy yourself in meditation, it gets peaceful and joyful. Don't think something must be wrong. And remember, look, you're not watching the breath. You're watching the piti sukha, the joy and happiness now, as you breathe in and out. So sometimes people think, oh, I should go back to the breath. The breath has done its job, now you're watching the happiness and the joy, which comes from, from meditation. And a uh, good old Ajahn Ganha, breathing in, sabha. <laughs> ah, sabha, that's what he was teaching. He just jumped right to this stage without even watching the breath first of all. And it was a pleasure, and it's important to get that pleasure, because once you get the joy and the happiness, you find you can sit down and meditate for a long period of time. And it's not effort, it's happiness and joy, you're having good fun. But it's a sort of happiness and fun, which is, and the, and the says here, it is, um, you learn to experience the mental formation as you breathe in and out, the mental formation of happiness and joy. And this gives you the clue that this is what you add on, or how you see the breath. It comes from the mind, it's not from the breath. The breath is never joyful, the breath is never blissful or happy. If it was, if it was in the breath, then you'd be happy all the time when you're breathing. It is just the way we look at the breath. And this is something I've said, it's an important part of meditation, I don't know why more people don't focus on it. It is that when your mindfulness starts to get strong, so you've done the, the first four parts of the, the mindfulness just on the breath, your, your breath, your mindfulness is supposed to be getting stronger and stronger. And as it gets stronger and energized, your mind becomes able to, to see beauty in all sorts of things. The pitter-patter of the rain. Little birds. What some people call boring. You find very pleasing. And you have these wonderful experiences uh, of uh, looking at, uh, what's one of these? Oh, my most beautiful clump of bamboo. First retreat I ever did in Cambridge, it was just vacation time, and we hired uh, boarding houses. And we only went for some exercise every morning before breakfast for one hour. And because I knew that territory very well, that I, my walk was to the botanical gardens in the back of Bateman Street. I still remember this, it was such a wonderful experience. Strange, but but very helpful in my mon monastic and also my spiritual life. I went for a walk for an hour, just supposed to be for exercise, but five minutes you know, from the boarding houses where we were doing meditation retreat. As I entered the back entrance of the botanical gardens, there was a clump of bamboo. A clump of bamboo, and as I passed it and I looked at it, glanced at it at first, I couldn't believe how beautiful it was. It's the most amazing clump of bamboo I'd ever seen. And of course, you know, you know that in Chinese watercolours they always have clumps of bamboo in the watercolour because it's a very sensuous, just you know, the way that it bends, you know, out of from gravity, but very, very um, slowly, gently, in a sort of parabola and how it tapers to the very end. All the leaves are not bulky and big, they're very, very slim. And their shape and their, their um, colours are just magnificent. And this was one of the most beautiful um, specimens of bamboo I'd ever seen. 
And I literally was, I was transfixed. I couldn't take my eyes away from it. It was just beautiful. But I had enough presence of mind to know that if I continued staring like that for another five or ten minutes, someone would see me, the student, <laughs> gaping at a clump of bamboo, and they would call the ambulance. <laughs> and I don't know about Hong Kong and Indonesia, but you know, you've got to be very careful sometimes because people don't understand meditation and letting go. First time I came here to Australia, uh, over in First Little Temple, and there was a Nepalese gentleman, and unfortunately he had an epileptic fit, and so I called the ambulance, and the, the ambulance men came, and uh, he was, you know, he's okay, but you know, they took him to the hospital because they asked him, the first thing they asked him, is, you know, what's your name and what day of the week is it? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. He said he didn't know. And that was a sign that, you know, he was, had an epileptic fit, could have been a stroke. So they put him in the back of the van. And then afterwards, I never told the ambulance men, but, you know, uh, I did not know what day of the week it was. <laughs> because it didn't concern me, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you know, what day is it today? You live for such a life and you don't watch the TV or see newspapers often and you don't know what day of the week it is. So from that time on I always made sure that I knew what day of the week it was, <laughs> otherwise they'd stop me and say, <laughs> and they'd say, what day of the week it is? Well, I don't know, it doesn't matter, it's just now. Present moment awareness, okay? In the van, sir. <laughs> so anyway, the... There was a bench next door, a bench close by, so I sat down on the bench so I could stare without people wondering that I was going crazy, I was on drugs or something. <laughs> and I just looked at this clump of bamboo, and there was never enough time for, it was a nine day retreat, eight days out of those nine, I just sat down and watched that clump of bamboo. Never finished with it. It was just delightful. And the end of the retreat, Back to studies, back to messing around with parties and girlfriends and stuff and, and work. And then I had a free afternoon. I got on my bicycle, so I'm going to go visit the most beautiful clump of bamboo in the world. And really excited, I got there and went into the gate and looked at the most dry, desiccated, ordinary. It was actually worse than ordinary. It's a bamboo, it doesn't grow in cold climates like England. It shouldn't have been there. It should have been in a hothouse or somewhere, but not out in the open. It was just dying and, and, and desiccated and just uh, grey and dusty. And, oh. and I just wondered, where's the most beautiful clump of bamboo? Where's it gone? It was obvious it was not in the clump of bamboo. It was in my mind. It was, say, Chitta Sankara. It was how I looked at the bamboo. And I could see it was just amazing when your mind is free from the hindrances and energized and the mindfulness is powerful. And of course, should I tell the other story about here in China Grove? <laughs> You're saying no, but now I started it, of course I have to. I'll just tell it in brief, but it's true. And, it is, uh, as, uh, as I remembered it, it was the middle cubicle in the male toilet block opposite the laundry. And some of the monks wanted to put a little sign in there. In this cubicle, Ajahn Brahm saw, and I'll let you know in a moment what I saw in the toilet bowl. <laughs> that means some good meditation. Yeah, you know, teaching and meditating and getting really blissed out. And so, but you know, you have to go to the toilet. So I went to the toilet. Instead of going to my room, that was closer. So you don't, I didn't use this one, it was too close to the, the hall. So I went in there and just the middle cubicle, sat down and did the number two. And then what happened afterwards, I just, you know, checked. Everything's okay. Oh, that's the, I've never in my life seen anything so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> the most beautiful piece of SHIT. <laughs> I've ever seen in my life. And uh, don't just, you know, next time, go and have a look. Not in mine, but yours. <laughs> All the different colours of brown. 
And noticed the way they were put together like a sculptor and, it was, and the fragrance was overpowering. <laughs> Beautifully so. Now, I think I was, many of you, I don't know why you keep laughing, it's, you must be as sick as I am. <laughs> but but, it's, but it's, I don't just say that just to, uh, to, um, uh, just to shock you. This was true. What was most, should usually be disgusting was actually very beautiful. And I remember one of the disciples, you know, he works at uh, CERN in Geneva, He's a top physicist. And he said that answered a question which you always wondered about in philosophy, the nature of beauty. Beauty is not in the eye of the beholder, it's in the mind. It's a chitta sankara. It's how the mind looks at things. So if I, because my mind was just really blissing out, very powerful, no hindrances to be seen, and he could look at a clump of bamboo, and he could also look at a piece of shit. And it was beautiful, literally. Fragrant, everything about it was just amazing. So that's actually a great insight there. What is beauty? What is ugliness? And ugliness, negativity, is when you have a very, very um, tired mind. Depressed. Ugh. Nothing is beautiful. Beauty is out there, or it's there to be seen, only when the mind is strong. And that person the other day, that English poet, William Blake, to see a world in a grain of sand, a heaven in a wildflower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand, and eternity in an hour. That was uh, describing those experiences. Just his mind was obviously so strong, I'm not sure whether he was on drugs or whatever, but certainly that his mind was so strong when he had those experiences. And what he saw, you know, was really powerful. Much more than you'd expect. And that happens. If that happens with a clump of bamboo and a piece of you know, number two in the toilet bowl, imagine what it'd be like when you're watching your breath. It really becomes beautiful. Beautiful breath and, you know, the sound of the, the rain on the roof. Symphony, or like that monk who his brother was snoring and it became for him just the most melodious music. It wasn't in the snoring, it was the Chitta Sankara he made out of it, the mind. So it's an important part to know that because that's where the pleasure and happiness come from meditation. It's a sign that your hindrances have got very weak and you got really energized. So, uh, oops. you learn to uh, experience the joy as you breathe in and out, the pleasure as you breathe in and out, experiences the mental formation of pity sukha as you breathe in and out, you learn to calm this mental formation. I'm going to maybe uh, change that word from calming to smoothing that mental formation as you breathe in and out. On those occasions you are mindful of experience having restrained the five hindrances, Energized, fully aware of the purpose and mindful. For being mindful of the pleasure associated with this stage of breath meditation is being mindfulness, mindful of experience. That is why on that occasion a meditator abides mindful of experience. Having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose and mindful. And of course, you know at those stages when you get pleasure in the meditation, you know you can sit for long periods of time. Not because you're trying to be at your personal best. You're not trying to do anything, you just can't move. You're just enjoying it. And I'm sure it's, sure it's happened to a few people that sometimes you're meditating and it's so lovely, so delightful. You know it's time for breakfast or lunch or a talk. So I should go to the talk, but then, uh, no, I can eat later on and you carry on meditating. And it's wonderful when that happens. You know, you'd rather have another half an hour, however long it takes in meditation, and go for lunch. Knowing you're going to miss out in the afternoon. Gives you an idea of just how joyful and happy it is. And I've said and say a lot that once the joy, the happiness starts to come into meditation, which comes eventually, 
that is where the meditation really takes off and people want to meditate a lot it's not well got to do half an hour of every, every day they say well you know just wait time off I'm going to meditate and enjoy because it really is joyful oh oh I've lost my place okay uh, then the, the next who I pressed the wrong button there's no trouble with these things too many buttons Four, I got 44 something. And a bit more. <coughs> Here we go. Oh. The next part. When you learn to experience the chitta as you breathe in and out. When you learn to brighten the chitta. I call it the nimitta, bring joy to the chitta as you breathe in and out. When you learn to settle the nimitta as you breathe in and out. When you learn to enter jhana as you breathe in and out. On those occasions you are mindful of the chitta, having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware. Uh, whoops, sorry. Having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose and mindful. Because I do not say that there is a development of mindfulness and breathing for one who is dull, who is not fully aware. In other words, reaching a jhana, with the hindrance is gone. That is why on that occasion a meditator abides mindful of the mind, having restrained the five hindrances, energized fully aware of the purpose and mindful. So you've got this beautiful, um, what's it called? Beautiful um, breath delightful, the joy, the happiness, and then you calm it down, and then the breath, like anything else, because it gets smooth, it vanishes, and that's when you get, you know, what I've been talking about, the nimitta, and for those people who say, oh, the nimitta is not mentioned by the Buddha in the suttas, it's in, uh, for those of you who uh, uh, will listen to this later on, it's in uh, the Upikalesa Sutta, number one to eight of the Majjhima Nikaya. Now the problem was though that uh, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, even though he mentioned this so many times, the whole Sutta is about the problems you have with nimittas <coughs> when you're meditating. But Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, I do try and scold him as best a monk can scold another monk. His translation was, he called it, that thing. <laughs> instead of nimitta because he couldn't really find an English word you know corresponding to nimitta and even these days I prefer using the Pali word nimitta but no it's it's about 20 different uh, cases of the nimitta not being able to hold it and develop it and because of excitement or too much energy too little energy fear and there it's in the suttas, but because of a translation which wasn't very clear, it's in the footnote. But you know what it's like in footnotes. Just, you know, when you signed up the, for the car insurance premium, they say, oh, uh, you only can pay the insurance when no one's driving it. <laughs> or some sort of loophole somewhere. People don't look at footnotes. So because of that, that um, people miss it. But it's right in there, and that's what the nimitta is. So what happens is you are watching your breath and the breath gets so beautiful, so peaceful, lots of joy. Joy is a sign you've got enough energy. And then the breath gets still and vanishes. And in its place you get this beautiful light in the mind called a nimitta. Now, as some people keep telling me, and it's so true that sometimes a nimitta, this light in the mind, comes and you can still feel your body, you can still hear sounds. All that really is, is that the nimitta is getting strong and the five senses are getting weak. A way to visually um, um, describe it is this, I said this even in interview time, these are your five senses and they usually take most of the energy because you have to see, you have to hear, like when I'm talking now. So the five senses get most of the energy, they're very, very strong turned on. And your mind is actually quite weak. It doesn't really get too much energy. 
because the five senses get the first part of it. And so what happens is as you come to a retreat center, you're not doing very much, you're not eating in the afternoon or the evenings, you're not watching movies or not playing football or table tennis or whatever. You know, things are getting calmed down. And actually that sometimes people think, oh, I haven't got really calmed down. But I don't know what it was like yesterday for you. I'm sure for many people, you get in that bus and you go out, oh, what's going on here? It's very sort of quite um, uh, a change, being in a monastery for a few days or a retreat center and see what it's like outside. You have slowed down enormously. And sometimes you don't notice it. But anyway, uh, your five senses get weakened and your sixth sense gets the energy. So it comes a time when they're about the same intensity, five senses in the mind. That's when just, just the mind, the chitta, starts to become uh, visible in your mind. Become aware of it, just a little light comes up every now and again. You can still hear, but the mind is getting enough power, it's starting to manifest. And sometimes, I <laughs> say to somebody, that sometimes if you do lots of meditation, you're really sort of hot with the deep meditations, and then that nimitta, your mind gets so strong that even when you're having lunch, you know, you're just, you're eating your food through the nimitta, there's a big light in front of you, and you've got to put it, that's easy enough to do, it's just a little bit disturbing at first until you get used to it, because the mind is just so strong, even when you're fully awake. But that's, you know, sometimes happens, but most of the time, it is just, you just get those in deep meditation. So you see a light come up in your mind, or a vision or something. And first of all, with the nimittas, don't ever think, oh, this can't be a nimitta. I'm just imagining it. There's a light on the wall somewhere. Oh, there's a flashlight or a headlight seen through the windows. And my goodness, if there was a flashlight or a headlight, you know, seeing through one of those high windows, it means that there's an aircraft about to crash into the meditation room, <laughs> or a flying car. Well, I'm not quite sure, but kangaroos don't jump that high. <laughs> so whatever it is, you know, it's not sort of a light, which is artificial. It is limitless. Only weak ones, and they can come up pretty early. So never doubt it, it probably is. And but the point is, those nimittas, when they first come out, they're not that strong. It's best to get back to the breath. Beautiful, delightful. When it gets really nice, oh yeah. Then your mind is pretty strong. And when the light comes up, you can actually be with it. And the, uh, the next two stages, when you experience that jitta, that nimitta, you learn to brighten the nimitta. Uh, they have a word that's called like sampasadana. And sampasadana means joy, but it also means like confidence. And what it really means is that you can actually stay with that, you can allow it to grow. And you know, you find joy in it, you're not afraid. And it just grows and grows and grows. You know, the nimitta starts to become more and more beautiful, more and more powerful. And it does get very powerful and very beautiful. And don't want to get it powerful and want to get it beautiful, otherwise you'll stop everything. It is when you're calm and peaceful, it just builds up energy by itself. And then when you learn to settle the nimitta, still it's samadhi, it must keep it still so it doesn't keep going all over the place. And so it doesn't move, it doesn't flash, it doesn't come and go, it just stays. And those two are part of how to deal with the light in the mind. And they always go together because the stronger it is, the easier it is to stay with it, it just grabs you, it's just so beautiful. Fear, please don't be afraid, because sometimes, and it happens, people see those nimitters and they think, oh my goodness, it's like watching a sun, it's so brilliant, so bright, I am going to go blind. You don't see it with your eyes, you know, you see it with the, the mind, so you can be as bright as you like. At other times, this is one of the wonderful hindrances, still it's a hindrance, but it's a nice one. Of all the hindrances, I think this is the one which people would most like to experience. And that's when you get afraid that you can't take so much pleasure. <laughs> More pleasure than you've had ever before. And it's just, no human being can take so much. 
And of course you can. So, so go for it. No fear at all. And it becomes, as it says, you probably heard the phrase many times, it becomes pabasara, radiant, like a sun. That's your little limiter. And it just comes, it'll happen to you. It's not just the stuff of monks. And then afterwards, you, or nuns, you just then go into it. You, the, the fourth of these, you are... Uh, and when you learn to enter the jhana, you liberate the jitta. They call it sort of vimocaya, vimoka, freedom. That's they liberate the, the, the mind. And all that, you liberate it from what? Just like the mind being in the, the, uh, the prison of the five senses. And it escapes. It escapes from the five senses, so it's in its own realm. Beautiful, powerful. People were even calling, talking today about what is the mind? Is the mind in the body? Is it in the brain? Where is it? And of course, I mean, that's a question which you'll never know the answer to until you know what you're talking about. What is this mind, this jitter? And here you find the jitta is, it is a separate, separate realm altogether. Oops. Well, God, that's better. So it's a separate realm altogether and it is uh, experiencing it for yourself. The five senses disappeared. It is like this is a simile which I developed, but it's based on the simile of the goldsmith. And if you have a gold and you want to make it into an ornament or jewellery, you have to first of all take out all the impurities from the gold. And once you have all the impurities removed, then you've got pure 100% gold, then you can find out the nature of gold as a chemist. You get insight into what gold is. But I instead use a simile of the emperor. The, an emperor uh, only appears in public wearing five clothings. The helmet covers his head, the jacket overlaps the top of the, the, the helmet down to the uh, wrists and to the waist, gloves which go overlap the, the sleeves of the jacket, and trousers which overlap the bottom of the jacket and big boots which cover up the feet and overlap the bottom of the, 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 uh, the trousers. Every part of the body of the emperor is covered with five pieces of clothing. And the emperor is a very important person, very powerful, but no one knows who the emperor is, whether it's a female or a male or whether it comes from Hong Kong or Jakarta. They haven't seen the emperor yet, whether it's old or young. They don't know what the emperor is, because all they've ever seen, the emperor appearing in five pieces of clothing, all covered up. And so if you want to find out the very important emperor, take the clothes off, and then you can find out exactly what the emperor is. And of course, that's similarly the five pieces of clothing are your seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. Five senses. When those get subdued, calm down, disappear, then you can see the emperor, the one in charge, the chitta. And the Buddha is saying here, I do not say there is the development of mindfulness of breathing for one who is dull, who is not fully aware. I mean, you, you really are getting some really powerful awarenesses here. When some people say, oh, yeah, I was really peaceful and still, and now oh, it was just so p peaceful, but you know, I'm not quite sure what was going on. And it, it's not jhana. That was just you know, calm, but you haven't got the awareness that this is really aware, fully aware, powerfully aware. And especially afterwards, when you emerge afterwards, wow! You are alert, alive, awake, like you've been on, on um, actually I've never had Red Bull, but people say that it gives this big boost of energy. 
but this is just pure energy, powerful, happy. So I remember once, this retreat years ago, someone came up to me and said, oh, I'm a bit disappointed. I said, why? What's happened? Our meditation is not so good, this retreat. Really, what happened? I said, oh, I could only get into second jhana, I couldn't get to third. What the hell are you talking about? Whatever it was, that wasn't any jhana. <laughs> Even in the first jhana, whoa, 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 that was, whoa. <laughs> It's wonderful states, and you are totally aware. You know, this is like being half dead compared to the mindfulness. This is why the Buddha says here, I do not say there is the development of mindfulness of breathing for one who is dull, who is not fully aware. Because when you get into those jhanas, the hindrances are gone. No sloth and torpor, no restlessness, no wanting, no ill will, no doubt, you are powerful, you are buzzing. And when you learn to explore impermanence in breath meditation, learn to explore things fading away in breath meditation, learn to explore things ceasing in breath meditation, when you learn to explore relinquishing things in breath meditation, on these occasions you are mindful of mind objects, the Dhamma, having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose and mindful, having seen with wisdom the impermanence, fading away, cessation and relinquishment of the five hindrances, you are mindful with equanimity. That is why on that occasion you are mindful of mind objects, having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose and mindful. That is how mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated completes the four focuses of mindfulness. So, first of all, that you are energized. Real meditation never makes you dull. You go through dullness, you go through sleepiness, but you persist and it really sort of energizes you. And the uh, seeing uh, the impermanence, fading away, cessation, relinquishment of the five hindrances. Those are the four things uh, which happen on the uh, the, what is it, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th stage of Anapanasati. And the impermanence, that is actually where you see things have, have always been there and now no longer there. The idea of impermanence, Anicca, I've got a lot of my understanding of Pali, you know, from the issues in the Vinaya. Because in the Vinaya, these are the monastic rules. And you know, when I, that's actually why I learned Pali, because some of the so many discussions about you know, what the rule really meant, what it didn't mean. And so I realized the only way to find out is to, to learn the Pali and read the Pali, read the Vinaya in Pali. The nice things about the Vinaya, they were ordinary events of ordinary people in ordinary life. So, you know, there was, you asked the nuns, Oh, it's too late because you went there yesterday. The group of six nuns, always being naughty. The group of six monks, I mean, they were just so naughty, those group of six monks. <laughs> those group of six monks. There was a group of 17 monks who were very, very young. They managed just to squeeze in, but they were very highly uh, looked after and pampered. So that as soon as they became novices, the group of six monks used to tease them. And they literally, like this is one of the rules, that they literally found one of those group of 17 monks, held him down and tickled him until he died. You know, the tickle to death. And then that was the story so many years ago. But, oh yeah, we've got a bit of time. The famous story about the holy water. Pajitya number eight for the bhikkhunis. Yeah, you know it now, don't you remember it? Another gross Ajahn Brahm story. This is not, this is from, check it out, the eighth Pajitya for Bhikkhunis. Because in those days, the nuns monastery, uh, they thought they couldn't be too far away from civilization because you know, they were uh, maybe uh, uh, subject to bad people coming to, to violate them and stuff. So that they were on the edge of town or maybe inside the town for safety. And of course, like any other place, had a nice wall, a nice compound, well looked after. But 
They didn't have sewage systems like we have these days. And so, it was a job of one of the nuns, a junior nun, to actually to empty the latrine. You know, we bucket and just put it in the sort of the, um, the cesspit where we're supposed to go. But on this morning, like people, you know, we're lazy. If there's a shortcut and no one's around to see us, we'll do it. So instead of throwing it into the sump or whatever it's supposed to go, she decided to throw it over the wall. It was really early in the morning. No one would sort of be walking at that time of the morning. But there is part of the Dhamma, eternal law, it's uh, called Murphy's Law. <laughs> and I think you all know Murphy's Law <laughs> in, in Hong Kong or in Jakarta. Murphy's Law says if it can happen, it will happen. <laughs> and it was true, that morning there was a gentleman who was going to the palace to see the king to negotiate a contract. He was a businessman. And so was, you know, in the early light of the morning, he was walking to the palace, thinking about how he's going to present his business proposition to His Majesty the King. He wasn't really all that mindful, thinking about just how much profit he can make when out of nowhere <laughs> came a bucket load of shit all over his head. Because <laughs> the nun didn't realise it's so unlikely there'd be someone on the other side of the wall, but that morning there was. And imagine just what it must be like. You know, you're growing into the equivalent in those days of a pinstripe suit and a nice tie, everything perfect, and you get a bucket of shit over you from nowhere. And he knew where it came from because the nuns and monastery was in there. So, you know, he was, he lost his equanimity. <laughs> he lost his kindness. And he went, I'm going to burn that monastery down. I'm going to, those aren't real nuns. I'm going to really sort of, and he was really enraged. Now, the only way you could see in that time of the morning, they had little like these uh, torches. They were uh, so soaked in resin and lit so people could see their way. So he took one of those and he went into the monastery, I'm going to burn this place down. And now th that's just one thing. A lot of times in those days, they were built out of wood, not bricks or stone. So that's why you could burn it down. So I'm going to burn the place down. And he that was very fortunate, there was this very smart talking gatekeeper, a man. And he said, where are you going? Look what they've done to me. Those aren't real nuns. I'm going to sort them out. I can't let them happen to do this to me. Look at me. And the, <laughs> the uh, attendant, the, the gatekeeper said, wow, that is auspicious. <laughs> you are so lucky to be blessed from those holy nuns. And of course, that's where we get the saying, holy shit. <laughs> and <laughs> this businessman, you know, people actually can't, it's amazing what people believe in when it comes to religion. <laughs> he said, listen, listen, that is so amazingly lucky. Something wonderful is going to happen to you. What were you doing anyway? I was going to the palace. Oh, quick, no time to burn down the monastery. Go home quickly, get changed, get washed, you know, cleaned up. And I'm sure you've got another pair of something to wear. Go to the palace, you're going to have good luck today. Guaranteed. And he brought it, he, he believed it. So off he went, got changed, went back to the palace, and it worked. He got this very good contract from the king, really lucrative. Made a lot of money out of it. So he never bothered to burn down the, the uh, <laughs> nuns watch. I think he gave a, a donation or something. <laughs> but anyway, you know what happens in business, you know, people talk to each other and just, how's your business? Oh, you're so lucky. So, no, look, this is how it's done. <laughs> forget about those monks monasteries, go to the nuns monastery. <laughs> and forget about ordinary water, all these blessings, yosa, whatever. Get the real thing, the real <laughs> thing, straight from the spot. <laughs> That's why I never told you the story yesterday, because I knew we were going to go to the nursery. <laughs> <laughs> and don't go back there. <laughs>
And so, of course, the word got around, the Buddha got to hear about it. <laughs> Come over here, nuns. <laughs> and he told her, look, you were so lucky that time, you know, that you had this smart-talking gatekeeper, you know, who convinced this guy not to burn down your monastery, that that was holy shit and a great blessing. And so, having reprimanded the, the nuns, he laid down a rule. The eighth Pajitya rule. If any nun, any bhikkhuni, throws shit over the monastery wall, she has to confess an offense of Pajitya to the other nuns. <laughs> she can't do that anymore. <laughs> and it's there, have a look. It's, it's a, sometimes you read some of that stuff and it's very funny. But it also just, you learn the language. This is ordinary language, what you know, people will do. <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> and so Anicca. Uh, the Anicca, it was they have people who bring food once a week at a certain time. That's called Nietzsche food, regular. And so you go over the road there. Uh, tomorrow is, today was Saturday, Sunday we get lots of people always coming. But Monday, oh we get uh, Shirley, that's Sister Gotami's sister. She usually comes to the monastery on Monday. There's some Thai ladies who come every Tuesday. They come every Tuesday for about 35 years. It's like a regular, it's their day. Other people come as well. But that's called Nietzsche food, the opposite of Anicca. So what Anicca, this impermanence, actually means, it means something which was always there is now not there anymore. It's gone. So, because something which is always there which is regular, you tend to take for granted, even to the point you don't see it. It's always there. And when it disappears, it's like there's a hole. Now, that simile brings me on, again, this side, to the simile of why jhanas, what's the point of them? Once there was a little tadpole, Tadpole or Fox story. This little tadpole, she was born in a lake in China Grove. <laughs> and she was a very smart little tadpole. And she went to tadpole school. And it did very well. And I finished a grade school, went to high school. And uh, she uh, did A levels in chemistry. And so she went to university, still in the lake. And there she graduated with honours in chemistry and then carried on doing a PhD in hydrology. <laughs> yeah, subject. And so she became an expert in water. And because it was close by and as many other people come to teach in a place like this, she did overhear some, some Burmese Sayadors are talking about the, the nature of water, Abhidhamma of water. And she even actually, when Ajahn Sujata was coming, talking about the four elements, heard Ajahn Sujata talking about water as well. Oh, this is, this is my subject. <laughs> and even though she spent all her life studying water and was regarded as an expert on water, how can a tadpole know about water? When the tadpole was born in water, grew up in water, lived all its life in water. Tadpole can know theory, but experience can't know water no more than a fish can. But the difference between tadpole and fish is that one day a little tadpole grows little arms and legs. Strange, but she's changing from a tadpole to a little frog. And one day, little frog, not really knowing what it's doing, presses the letting go button. And she emerges out from the water onto a place where she's never been to before, dry land. Like in the realm of the five senses, suddenly they, they disappear. And in this incredible world of the jhanas. Now, little tadpole, this is weird, this is strange. 
This is like nothing she's ever experienced before. And later on she'll be able to understand why it was so strange. Something which has always been there for his whole life. Water. It's now gone. It's disappeared. Something which was so regular has vanished. It's anichad. That's what anicca means. Five senses. Do you know what the five senses are? In theory, but when they disappear, then you really know. Your body? Yeah, I know my body. Brush its teeth, take it to the toilet, see just how beautiful its shit is. And <laughs> when I go good meditation. But I don't really know until the body disappears. And the will? Do you know what the will is? I confused you a lot in the first couple of days, talking about the will is not yours. How can you find that out? When you're in the water, you can't really understand what water is. But when you jump out, then you can get some information. And even consciousness mind to see that vanish. Ooh, that is freaky. But that's what we do. That's why we understand what anicca is. Things which were always there, now disappearing. Fading away. Uh, and what else we got? Fade away. Oh, always go too far. Fading away. And a cessation. Things stop. Where's the world gone? Can't find it. Disappeared. And relinquishment. You let them go. So that is uh, the insight, which happens automatically. You don't say, now I'm going to do insight. You say, what the heck is this? You can't stop doing it. It's weird. Okay, just quickly. Four focuses of mindfulness complete seven enlightenment factors. So you've done your four uh, foundations of mindfulness, Anapanasati then. When you're mindful of the body, restrain the five hindrances, energize, fully aware of the purpose of mindful. On that occasion, you, are, you get the uh, steady mindfulness in you. On whatever occasion the steady mindfulness is established, and on that occasion the mindfulness enlightenment factor is aroused in you, you start it, you develop it, and by development it comes to fulfillment in you. The mindfulness really goes strong. What's the enemy of mindfulness? The five hindrances. And when you are mindful, you explore the Dhamma. You're so aware, you can see all sorts of the world, see a world in a grain of sand, a heaven and a wild flower, infinity in the palm of your hand, the mind is so powerful, you can see anything. You explore the Dharma with wisdom. On that occasion, the exploration of Dharma, enlightenment factors aroused in you, develop it, and by development it comes to fulfillment in you. When you explore the Dharma with wisdom and embark on a full inquiry into it, unflagging energy is interesting, it's not tiring. You're enjoying this. Energize. <laughs> a lot of time because you'll be mindful, you explore, energize. If you think, you lose energy. Explore, and then you gain energy. Uh, whenever unflagging energy is aroused as you explore the Dharma with wisdom, on that occasion the energy enlightenment factor is aroused in you. You develop it, and by development it comes from fulfillment in you. When you have aroused energy, Unworldly joy. This is one of the first time you put this down. Unworldly, nothing to do with, with worldly stuff and with attachments and clinging. It's a joy which takes you out from the world. On whatever occasion unworldly joy arises, that occasion a joy enlightenment factor is aroused in you. You develop it by development. It comes with fulfillment in you. When you experience unworldly joy, your body and mind become tranquil. On whatever occasion the body and mind become tranquil and you experience joy, on that occasion the tranquility and enlightenment factor is aroused in you and you develop it and by development it comes fulfillment in you. Just pause there. Your tranquility, the body becoming tranquil at peace, the mind tranquil and peaceful because of joy. Not force, not training, not sort of uh, endurance, but from joy when you're having a wonderful time inside. And people think, wow, is he dead? He's not moved? 
but you're just so joyful. That is where the tranquility comes from. So, developing the joy. And it is one of the reasons, deliberately, you know, you tell, crack a few jokes, make it happy. So gross stories, like, you know, the contents of a toilet of bowl and, and nuns doing special holy water. That joy, that energy, that is actually done on purpose, a teaching tool. To actually to start a little bit of joy coming up. Because you find, if I keep telling stories and jokes and they're enjoyable, you will stay here. If you really get bored, you either fall asleep or you go out. Tranquility, coming from joy, not willpower. And then, when your body is tranquil and you feel pleasure in the mind, this is what happens, you get so, so nice to be here. The mind becomes still. On whatever occasion the mind becomes still and joyful, on that occasion the stillness, that samadhi, the enlightenment fact is aroused in you. You develop it and by development it comes to fulfillment in you. It's another thing which really stood out to me. It's in Pali, Sukhino Chitang Samadhiati. It is from the joy, the happiness, that the mind becomes still and enters deep meditation. Never from force, never from fear, from joy. That was a, such a powerful spiritual awakening just to know this is a joyful path. It's not through force and endurance. You don't need to be the Bruce Willis, the Bear Grylls, or whoever it is, just great endurance people. Uh, no, it's nothing to do with that at all. It's to do with happiness and joy and wisdom. And you observe such a still mind with equanimity, on whatever occasion you observe the equi with equanimity the still mind, on that occasion the equanimity enlightenment factors aroused in you, and you develop it, and by development it comes to fulfillment in you. That is how the four focuses of mindfulness develop and cultivate and complete the seven enlightenment factors, and the seven enlightenment factors, uh, when developed, that means you're now a fully enlightened. So that's already four o'clock and a bit. So I think we'll finish there. Again, you have access to, to this, so you can always read a little bit more later on when you go home or whatever. And so that means that uh, I did a lot of this. I ch chose what I thought eventually was the most important for you. And hopefully uh, it's, uh, it's uh, supported the meditation and everything else I've been teaching. Sadu, Sadu, Sadu. <laughs> Very good. And just uh, a little extra because sometimes people ask me, Ajahn Brahm, why do you do these stupid Sadu bits? I never invented them. That was a monk called Ajahn Singtong in Thailand, believe it or not. I just, you know, took what he, he started and, and took it a little bit further. <laughs> but surprisingly, not that much further. <laughs> because he did this blessing. When I went, to, he was a very good disciple of Ajahn Mahabur, Thai forest tradition, highly regarded, great meditator. Ajahn Mahabur called him enlightened. But what, he would give the blessing. I went to visit these monks when I was after five years. When I went to visit him, you know, he would give the blessing, like the blessing some of you may have heard in Bodhinyana um, today. He started off, you'll hear it tomorrow. Yata wari waha pura pari parenti sagarang. That's how we do it. He started, Yata wari waha pura pari parenti sagarang. Ewa mewa ito dinang peta nang upa ichi tong bati da. Tom hanki wa mewa sami jatu sabe parentu sagaba chidab. And the first time I saw that, I was totally confused. <laughs> what is going on? Am I supposed to carry on like that, or what am I supposed to do? But what I did see, that he was just so loved, and so had this great rapport with everybody. And you, know, you can see how it works there. 
You make it interesting, a bit of fun, a bit of joy, energy, power, and that's where I got that uh, uh, yet uh, sadhu from, from Ajahn Singtong. So unfortunately, he passed away. It was a great tragedy in 1979, I think. About then, there was a big plane crash, and many, many senior monks died in the plane crash. He was one of them. So anyway, it was amazing just, you know, just to see the way he could relate to everybody. Amazing monk. Anyway, so there goes the uh, Sutta class. There's going to be another uh, class later on, but apparently that I did promise if you wanted to do some offerings now, those with the robes, and now's a good time to do it. Do we need it recorded? Nah. Okay, first come.